call it the House of Alarion. The Lord of the Tides and Master of Driftmark, renowned in song and story as the Sea Snake, and is surely one of the most extraordinary and influential figures of the Dance of the Dragons and its build-up. Corlys was born in 53 AC on Driftmark to Colin Valarian and his lady wife. He was named after his great-granduncle, Sir Corlys Valarian, who had served King Aegon I as the first Lord Commander of the King's Guard. He would travel further than any sailor before him, and single-handedly make his house the richest in the realm, passing even the Lannisters. House Valarian has a storied Valyrian lineage, being one of the handful of houses to have Valyrian descent. The Valarians had come to Westeros even before the Targaryens had left the doomed Valyrian peninsula. If their family histories can be believed, they ended up settling in the Gullet on a low-lying and fertile isle of Driftmark, so named for the driftwood that the tides brought daily to its shores, rather than the stony, smoky neighbour Dragonstone, the future home of House Targaryen after the Doom. The Never Dragon Riders, the Valarians had for centuries remained the oldest and closest allies of the Targaryens, marrying into the family many times. The Aegon the Conqueror's own mother of House Valarian, King Jaehaerys the Conciliator's mother, was also a Valarian. The sea was their element, not the sky. During the conquest, it was the Valarian ships that carried Aegon's foot soldiers across Blackwater Bay, later formed the greater part of the royal fleet. Throughout the first century of Targaryen rule, so many lords of the tides served on the small council as marshal of ships that many assumed the office was hereditary. Yet even with such forebearers, Corlys Valarian was a man apart, a man as brilliant as he was relentless, as adventurous as he was ambitious. It was tradition for the Sons of the Seahorse, the sigil house Valarian, to be given a taste of a seafarer's life when young, but no Valarian before or since has ever taken to shipboard life as eagerly as the boy who had become known as the Sea Snake. He first crossed the narrow sea at the age of six, sailing to the free city of Pentos with an uncle. Thereafter, Corlys made such voyages every year. Nor did he travel as a passenger and in comfort as one might have expected. He climbed masks, tied knots, scrubbed decks, pulled oars, corked leaks, raised and lowered sails, manned the crow's nest, learned to navigate and steer. His captain said they'd never seen such a natural sailor as a young Corlys. At the age of 16, Corlys became a captain himself, taking a fishing boat called the Cod Queen from Driftmark to Dragonstone and back. In the years that followed, his ships grew larger and swifter, his voyages longer and more dangerous. He took ships around the bottom of Westeros to visit Old Town, Lannisport and Lordsport on Pike. He sailed to Lys, Tyrosh, Pentos and Myr. He took the Summer Maid to Volantis and the Summer Isles and the Ice Wolf North to Bravos. He was by the sea and hard home before turning into the Shivering Sea for Lord and the port of Ibim. On a later voyage, he and the Ice Wolf headed north once more, searching for the rumoured passage around the top of Westeros, but finding only frozen seas and icebergs as big as mountains. His most famous voyages, however, were those he made on the ship that he designed and built himself, the Sea Snake. Traders from Old Town and the Arbor often sailed as far as the mysterious and secretive city of Carth in search of spice, silk and other treasures. But Corlys Valarian and the Sea Snake were the first to go beyond, passing through the Jade Gate to Yi Ti and the Isle of Lang, returning with so rich of a load of silk and spice that he dabbled the wealth of his house in a single voyage. On his second voyage aboard the Sea Snake, he sailed even further to a shy by the shadow. On his third, he tried the Shivering Sea instead, becoming the first Westerosi to navigate the Thousand Isles and visit the bleak cold shores of Nagai and Mosavoy. In the end, Corlys, with his Sea Snake, made nine voyages. On the ninth and final, Sir Corlys took the Sea Snake back to Carth one last time. He took with him enough gold to buy 20 more ships, wherein he loaded them all with saffron, pepper, nutmeg, elephants, bolts of the finest silk. Only 14 of the fleet safely arrived at Driftmark, and all the elephants sadly died at sea. Yet even so, the profits from that voyage were so vast that the Valarians became the wealthiest house in the Seven Kingdoms, eclipsing even the High Towers and Lannisters, albeit briefly during the years before the Dance of the Dragons. The wealth Sir Corlys put to good use when his aged grandsire died at the age of 88 and the Sea Snake became Lord of the Tides. The seat of House Valarian was Castle Driftmark at the time, a dark, grim place, always damp and often flooded. Lord Corlys raised a new castle on the far side of the island. High tide was built of the same pale stone as the Eyrie, its slender towers crowned with roofs of speed and silver that flashed in the sun. 
When the morning and evening tides rolled in, the castle was surrounded by the sea connected to Driftmark proper, only by a causeway. To this new castle, Lord Corliss moved the ancient Driftwood throne, a gift from the Merlin King according to legend. The Sea Snake built ships as well. The royal fleet tripled in size during the years he served the old King Jaehaerys as master of ships. Even after giving up that office, he continued to build, turning out merchantmen and trading galleys in place of warships. Beneath the dark and salt-stained walls of Castle Driftmark, three modest fishing villages grew into a thriving town called Hull, with a row of ship hulls that could always be seen below the castle. Across the island near High Tide, another village was transformed into Spice Town, its wharves and piers crowded with ships from the three cities and beyond. Sitting athwart the gullet, Driftmark was closer to the narrow sea than Duskingdale or King's Landing, so Spice Town soon began to usurp much of the shipping that would elsewise have made for those ports, and House of Larian grew ever richer and more powerful. Even before he became Lord of the Tides, the Sea Snake had lived more than most men twice his age, and as the adventurous chapter of his life came to an end, he still had a long and influential life to lead, marrying a queen who never was, fathering dragon-riding children, raging wars up and down the narrow sea, and playing a key role in the Dance of the Dragons.